Well, you know, recently, and I don't know why I, uh, why I did this, but I had the opportunity to look up the history of pinball machines. Now, probably, you know, what really was racking my brain, why did I know this? <laughs> why do I know this? Um, uh, because sometimes, you know, if, I don't know if you, do you have to ever do this, that if you're either listening, you're, you're reading something in a book, you're listening to something, or you're watching something, you immediately go to that source of all information, Wikipedia, right? Is that person still living? Or where did that come from? Or, you know, something about different things, right? So I must have seen something uh, on television. I, it's all I can think of. So I looked up the history of uh, pinball machines. So I learned something. I learned that from the 1940s, the mid-1940s to the mid-1970s, playing pinball was illegal in New York City, Chicago, and Los Angeles, and maybe some other places also. Why was it illegal? Because it was considered gaming, like, you know, uh, uh, gambling. Right? I, that you put the money in and then you pull the lever, the ball goes and it just goes wherever it's going to go. Right? I, and, uh, and so, uh, of course, uh, the, uh, many, uh, you know, gaming machines, pinball machines, there was a big, uh, you know, uh, the, the, we'll just say organized crime was involved. Right? Uh, and then it was uh, understood to be a source of juvenile delinquency, right? Uh, looking back, I'm sure that, you know, there's a lot more fish to fry, right? <laughs> but anyway, I, that's, um, that, that is uh, a little bit of that, that history. And so in the, in the 1970s, it was all repealed. And one of the reasons that it was uh, repealed was because of the introduction of flippers. You know what I'm talking about, right? The things on us, all right? Because you could have a little bit of control over what happens to the ball. Prior to that, there was no control over what happens to the ball. And I thought to myself, now, isn't that a good example of often the way that we live life, being like one of those pinballs, right? That, uh, you know, we're just sitting there and wham, right? I, we bounce off of one thing to the next, here and there, and it, everything just seems so random, and we just react to situations like, you know, I'm coming down, I hit this thing, boom, I'm over here now, and, and over here, and, I, and, I, and you know, it, it certainly that is I, what, what happens to us uh, that we're flung in one direction or the other, uh, reacting to events. We don't always give thought to the way that we react. It just sort of happens, right? And, uh, uh, and of course, that's not how we want to really. Uh, it's not the optimal way of living life. And, you know, in ancient Israel, there was a situation where uh, people were kind of reacting like pinballs. And a prophet came along, uh, and uh, encourage them otherwise. And so uh, we're going to take a little bit uh, of a look at this prophet, see what we can uh, learn from him. And that is one of the smallest books of the Bible. And that is the prophet Haggai. The prophet Haggai. Okay. Now, we need to know that uh, Haggai is one of a handful of prophets who lived after the Babylonian captivity, right? Most of the prophets were warning people about this captivity, right? Like Isaiah and Jeremiah, uh, Hosea, uh, Obadiah, uh, all of them were all before the captivity, warning them that Jerusalem will be destroyed and so on and so forth, you know, unless the people repent and and, uh, and then after the captivity, you have three prophets, right? One is Haggai, another one is Zechariah, and the other one is Malachi, all right? Uh, and uh, so they wrote after the captivity. And in particular, Haggai and Zechariah were contemporaries 
I, very interestingly, they were at the very same time, you know, and, uh, and kind of had both messages that were somewhat similar. Uh, Zechariah had a series of visions, and so it gets in, involved. Haggai, basically what we see here, he was, he is a, a great example of what a prophet really was, and that was like a preacher. Right? He, uh, he's exhorting the people. Almost the whole, most of the two chapters, it's four messages. He gives four different messages in this book. The, and they're dated in the book. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a very good example of he was both a, a foreteller and a fourth teller. He both uh, preached uh, and, and looked forward, you know, to the, uh, to the, to the future. All right. So the situation was is that the people had come back from the uh, captivity. The people had had come back from the Babylonian captivity, uh, and uh, we read in the beginning of Ezra, in particular, the first few chapters of Ezra, uh, that uh, they began to rebuild the temple. They began to rebuild the temple. They laid the foundation. They collected, you know, all, all the things that they needed to, and and they began the work. But it was very difficult. The work was very hard. Uh, and they uh, became, uh, I wouldn't use the word exactly disillusioned, but uh, they, uh, uh, they began to take what we might call the path of least resistance, like stop working on the temple because it's really difficult, because there are, there are forces of darkness in our land uh, that are giving us a very difficult time. Right, uh, and and so they begin to work on it, and then a number of years go by when they don't work on it. Right, and so now enters Haggai the prophet. Right, uh, and uh, and I and I said as I said there, there's four messages in, in here. The first one is really an exhortation uh, of the people. Basically, he says to them. Uh, you know, you're, you're taking care of your own uh, houses uh, while the temple is lying desolate. You're, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, and by the way, when he says this, he says uh, in verse 4 of chapter 1, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? You know, when you read that, you're thinking, oh, well, like they had paneling. You, 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 know, I, you know what it basically it means? They had a roof. Basically, what it means is that they, they had a roof on their, they had a, you know, they, they had a roof over their head, basically, is, is what that means. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Some translations use like product names. It's kind of weird. Anyway, I, uh, but then he, what he says, he doesn't just say go build the temple. See, this is, this is what's interesting about this prophet. And this is something that we can really, really, uh, get from this. He doesn't just say, go build, it. go build the temple. What's the matter with you? Right? He says, consider your ways. Consider your ways. Because you see, they needed to come, they needed to understand what the problem was. Not just be told what the problem was. They needed to understand what the problem was. Now, in Hebrew, I uh, consider your ways literally, and probably in some translations have this, set your heart on your path. Set your heart on your path. Now, the, the, uh, um, you know, simu levavchem is what, levavchem, simu levavchem, or sim levav, in, you know, in modern Hebrew. And, uh, that, that little phrase in modern Hebrew means pay attention. Like, pay attention, like with an exclamation mark. Sometimes it's used on a road sign. Like if it's slippery when wet, right? I, there's another word for caution in Hebrew, but sometimes you have this where it says pay attention. And I, I'll never forget that when I was in Israel I, a few years ago, I was driving on a road on a highway I, and I know I, I recognized it as from like from Haggai, you know, and so it was really kind of interesting. So pay attention, consider your ways, think about what you're doing, basically. Set your heart on your ways. Think about your path. Think about what you're doing. Uh, and he says it several different times. He says it in verse 5, and he says it in verse 7. Think about uh, what you're doing. 
In other words, you know, you, think about your calling. Think about what's going on around you. Think about the trajectory of, uh, you know, of, of, of what, of what you're engaged in. And so it is a great word of get your priorities in order. Because sometimes we can simply be like that pinball. This is what's going on, so this is how I react, and this is what I do. I, or I know I should be doing something, but I'm not doing it, and I think about it all the time. I really ought to do that thing, but I'm not doing it, right? And this really I, is uh, what, the, what the prophet was saying. Think about your calling. Think about your work. Think about the words that you use, right? And so he tells them, you need to be, re- you need to be building the temple. For us, it could be a million different things, right? It could be for all of us, uh, you know, when when we see things happen in the world, you know, like, uh, uh, well, there's a lot of things, right, Uh, over the past number of years. But right now, you you know, what what we see happening in in the Ukraine, I, I think that it's important for us to say, you know, wow, you know, anything can happen. I need to get my act together. I need to get my priorities right and not wait and one of these days I'll, you know, I'll get back into the flow of things because it might be too late, right? Consider uh, your ways. What am I, what am I doing? Okay, so I, I, they respond. That's an amazing thing. In, in almost every prophet, the people never respond. Here they respond. They respond well. They, uh, they basically repent and they begin to rebuild the temple. Okay. They don't, uh, throw rocks at, at Haggai, uh, or, uh, you know, or anything like that. All right. And, uh, and, and so, um, I, uh, we read here that not only, uh, uh, do they respond, but then the prophet says something to them as they begin this work. He says in verse 13 of chapter one, I am with you, right? I am with you. That, in other words, I'm not, uh, this is not punishment, right? I'm with you. You, you're, you know, you set your priorities right. You do the right thing. I'm with you. And then, uh, he says, uh, uh, to them, uh, you know, not, not to, uh, not to fear. Uh, and, uh, and so they go about rebuilding the temple. Now, the prophet gives another message about a month later. He speaks again, okay, in chapter two. Uh, he uh, he he anticipates, or he maybe he himself remembers that first temple. Remember Solomon's temple was a great grand temple, right? Now they're rebuilding the temple. This is the second temple that they're building, uh, and it's not nearly as glorious looking as the first temple. And so he says. You remember that first temple? Remember, you know, what it looked like? And I, uh, you know, I, uh, and, and so he says, uh, does, does it not, does this temple, verse three, does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? Then in verse four, but now take courage. Now Zerubbabel was the governor. He was actually descended from David and he was the leader of the people when they returned. Zerubbabel is his name. If you're looking for a child's name, Zerubbabel. Okay. Hey, he's descended from David. What, what do you want? Okay. Uh, he says, take courage. And Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Now, this is not Joshua of the book of Joshua, right? This is a Joshua who lived many, many, many hundreds of years later, right? And he was the high priest at this time. And so he says, take courage, declares the Lord, and work for I am with you. He says it again. I am with you says the Lord. As for the promise which I made to you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. So isn't it interesting? He goes back, just like if you remember uh, when um, I talked about Micah a few weeks ago, that the prophets, they, they go back to the common remembrance, the common history that, that everybody can relate to, right? Egypt. Right? And just, and now Egypt was hundreds of years earlier. None of these people had lived there, but they had this, the, you know, the handed down from generation to generation what God had done for them. 
And so he says, as for the promise which I made you when you came out of Egypt, he says, I'm still the same God now as I was then, you know? Uh, and boy, hasn't a lot of history going under the bridge uh, between then and when these people lived. But he says, I'm still the same. I'm still the same. Take courage, right? Do not fear. My spirit is abiding in your midst. Uh, and so there's a great lesson in that. You know, uh, he doesn't say compare the first temple to the second temple, and this one really isn't that good, right? And so, you know, kind of a it's kind of a downer, isn't it? No, he's encouraging them. He's saying, don't look back. Don't look back. Look forward. This is where you are now, right? You build this temple, and you will see what's going to happen in this temple. And so he encourages them. Don't fear. Don't judge this temple by what it looks like. Don't judge this situation by, by what it looks like. And so he encourages them. And isn't that true uh, indeed for us, right? We need to think about our priorities, what we're doing, where we're at. And we all have a tendency to look backwards, right? Uh, and think about the good old days, uh, or things were better then, right? We hear that all the time. I hear that all the time. Things were better then, better than now, uh, and it, you know the glass is half empty. Uh, everything's really just lousy, uh, and that's it. Something very important about the prophets. To uh, the prophets, yes, were very honest about the way things were. But they also had this hope of the future that affected the present. None of them, none of the prophets were, it is so bad, just throw in the towel, lay down, and die. Okay? That is not uh, how, how the prophets operated. Okay? Uh, now, these people who had returned, these were, these, this is the remnant of Israel. Uh, you know, these are the people that came back. These are not, um, you know, uh, uh, terrible people. These are not, you know, people like you read about in Micah or in Amos who were uh, doing all kinds of uh, horrible things. These are the people who had returned, but they became discouraged. They became discouraged. Even the remnant can be discouraged, right? No matter who we are, we can be discouraged if... We look to how things look uh, to decide how the future is going to be, you know? Uh, uh, because, you know, optimism and pessimism, I've said this before, optimism and pessimism, the way we define them uh, is based on how things look. Are things looking better? Well, then I'm optimistic. Are things looking bad? Well, then I'm going to be pessimistic. That's kind of like being a pinball, you know? But uh, we, uh, our uh, feet are uh, on solid ground when we are focused on the Lord, on the Word of God, uh, and we place our trust uh, in, in Him and get our priorities right and begin to do and live the right way, uh, no matter what, right? No matter what the opposition may be, no matter uh, uh, the way things used to be, Right, and that is how he uh, he encourages these people. He actually says to them, he says uh, in verse six of chapter two, "For thus says the Lord of hosts: Once more, in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all the nations, and they will be and they will come with the wealth of all the nations, and I will fill uh, this house with glory." says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give shalom. I will give peace, uh, declares the Lord. And then if you go, jump down to almost the end of the book, he says this in verse, uh, in verse 20. And this is another message that he gives. Right, I, uh, he says in verse twenty-one. 
speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, and I'll overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the power of kingdoms of the nations. And I will overthrow the chariots and their riders, and the horses and their riders will go down, everyone uh, by the sword uh, of another. So he repeats this uh, this uh, shaking, right? I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. And so basically what he is saying is, uh, well, actually, I should read the last verse. The very last verse says, On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. So it's very interesting when he talks about this shaking and he's looking at this temple. He looks at this smaller temple and he calls it glorious and he refers to the former glory and the latter glory. What he does, he's looking at that temple as a symbol of the future, as a symbol of of the future. He looks at Zerubbabel at the end in the same way, as a symbol of the future. It's like taking two things and bringing them together, the far distant future and the immediate future uh, when it comes to the temple and the place, and as as well as Zerubbabel and the and the and the future. So he talks about this shaking, this shaking. Now, what's interesting, about 500 years after this, about 500 or so years after this, uh, there is a a letter written to Jewish Messiah followers who were experiencing great turmoil and great difficulty. Right About 500 years later, it's after Yeshua comes, right? Uh, after the resurrection, after the pouring out of the Ruach, and you know, during that first century uh, of uh, tumultuous activity, right? You have this letter to these Jewish believers. And in the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, 500 years later, refers back to Haggai, refers back to this uh, promise of what God would do, right? Uh, and so, uh, let's see here. He says um, in verse twenty, beginning in verse twenty-five of chapter twelve of Hebrews. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him, who warned them on earth, much less shall we escape who turn away from him who warns. From heaven. He says, don't give up. This is in plain English saying, don't give up. Don't turn away. Don't give up. And then what does he say? And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. And this expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things in order that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Right? Uh, And so when Haggai is talking about this temple, this smaller temple, we know that this temple... Something happened in this temple that did not happen in Solomon's temple, in that very temple that they were building. Yeshua was in that temple. The Messiah himself was brought there as a baby. He taught there. He prayed there. He was there. And so, very interesting, what happens in this smaller temple in years to come, not in these people's lifetimes, But as they looked forward from their vantage point, it was all in the future, right? That temple was indeed glorious. And uh, as we read in the book of Hebrews, there's going to be, you know, a further, another shaking of the heavens uh, and the earth and everything. You know, have you ever been in an earthquake, in a real earthquake? I've been in an earthquake in Los Angeles. 
And I, uh, and you know, I, uh, when you live out there, very, very interesting. I, who knew? You know, there's actually a different culture, not just, you know, in all the negativity, but in the way, just the way you live, right? So for example, you know, in your house, you like have bookcases and stuff like that. You know, we just, like here, Beth, we just put them up. Everything's nailed to walls. Everything that you have in it, that, that could tip over, if it's near a wall, of course, you screw into the wall, right? And then you, everybody has like their, uh, you know, their, their hidden away a box with that has, you know, everything, you know, three days of supplies or four days of supplies. And I'll never forget it. When my son Mark was in kindergarten, we had to bring, the first day of school, not only, you know, do you bring all the, the little paraphernalia little kids bring to school, but we had to bring a box. And the box needed to have a picture of him in it. And then also, like, a little toy and some other things as, as well, right? Because of the, the possibility uh, of an earthquake, which could happen. There's no, it doesn't have to be a cloud in the sky, right? It just happens, Right? And things can fall down. So when it says here the earth is going to shake, basically what he's saying is everything that's not, you know, that's, that is uh, not attached to something else is going to go flying. And the only thing that's going to ultimately last is God's kingdom, you know? And so what, uh, what both um, Haggai and the writer of Hebrews is saying, be on the right side of history, you know? Be on the right side of history. Be attached to Yeshua. Be attached to Yeshua, and you'll be okay, right? I, and so that's what he's saying here, that, that um, God is saying, I am greater than whatever you see here. I'm greater than the problems in the land of rebuilding the temple. You get your priorities right. You live the right way. You trust me. No matter what happens, and even if you die, you will live, right? Uh, and, and so he says that, that um, uh, you know, be encouraged. Be encouraged. Don't look backwards. Don't compare this temple to the other temple. Just recognize that what you're doing is a work of God, and it's glorious. And continue, and continue uh, in it. And he says, I am with you. Do not fear. And just like what you read, these people in Haggai's day, these were not, these people were not with Moses. They weren't there in the, in the wilderness. They know about it the way we know about it. They know about it from, uh, from the Bible. They know about it from what was handed down. And what does Haggai say? It was true then and it's true now. And we can say, I think, with assurance, and it is true to this day as well. And so we can look forward, uh, and we can continue doing the work that, that we're doing, uh, not to compare this age with ages past, or the good old days, or whatever it may be, but we're focused on Yeshua, just as we read in uh, in the uh, the beginning of the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews, with such a great cloud of witnesses, put aside everything that gets in the way, right? And keep your eyes focused on Yeshua and keep moving forward. That's what he said to these people. That's what he says to us. And it's true for us, not only in our, uh, you know, communally, but even individually in, in the way we live our lives. We need to stop being pinballs and just reacting to things. We need to consider our ways. We need to think about how we react to situations and do so in a way that is edifying and that causes us to react in a way that, that God tells us to, right? Because what does he say at the very end to Zerubbabel? You're my signet ring. Well, we're, you, you remember Esther? It's coming up. Remember that signet ring of the king? Remember how um, he had signed an edict, uh, you know, to basically uh, rid the kingdom of Jews, right? Uh, and now uh, the uh, the plot of Haman comes to light, but oh no, the king signed the edict with his signet ring, and so he couldn't change it. He had to make a new edict, because you can't change the edict 
that has the imprint of the signet, signet ring of the king. And so what do we read uh, here at the very end? On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant, declares the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring. You are the sign of the future. Now, Zerubbabel in himself was not the future. Zerubbabel lived and died. He was a governor. He was not the king. But he was descended, you know, from uh, uh, from David. And just like that second temple, which was smaller than the first temple, Zerubbabel uh, was not King David, right? But both that temple and Zerubbabel served as a sign of God's presence that he would never leave them, he would never forsake them, uh, and that he would be faithful to the end. He says here about Zerubbabel, he says, um, he calls him his servant and his chosen one. It's very really interesting. He calls him his servant and his chosen one, right? We know without going into all the texts that that is a description, that is a messianic description. You go back to the beginning of Isaiah 42. That's a my servant, the one whom I have chosen. And I would suggest that he uses this terminology uh, on purpose. Okay? He says, uh, you know, uh, uh, I will make you, he, well, my servant. And then at the end he says, for I have chosen you. Uh, and, and so Zerubbabel is a sign of God's faithfulness to the end. And so uh, what Haggai is saying is keep, keep doing the right thing. You know, there is the blessed hope. There is indeed the future. Uh, you know, the, the reality is, may I say this to us? When we look at the world around us, no matter what, I am going to say that the world is not going to come to an end. I'm going to go out on the lid and say that. The world is not going to come to an end, okay? That there is a future to this world. We may not see it. It may not be in our lifetimes. But there is a future to this world, and we need to keep our eyes on that and recognize that. Peter calls it a living hope, right? A living hope. That means it, it may be out there, but it, but it affects the way I live now. Therefore, I have hope now, even if I don't see that end result, but I know that it's going to come. And so therefore, when I see things happen in this world that affect me and that like shake me up, they're all opportunities. They're like sounds of the shofar, right? You know, on, on Rosh Hashanah, we blow the shofar, right? Like wake up, the wake up call. Events in this world Wherever, they, whether they're in our home or wherever they may be, those events uh, are like a shofar to wake us up, get our act together, get our priorities right, so that we can continue to live, uh, you know, in a, in a way that pleases God and makes a difference in this world, you know. And of course, you know, Haggai says uh, we didn't focus on this part of the message. He says, you know, you look around you and you're not satisfied. You don't, you work hard and you don't have, maybe you ought to think about the way you're living. You know, uh, you accumulate, you accumulate and you accumulate, uh, but you're not getting, uh, there's no traction here, right? Maybe it's because of the way we're living that we're not satisfied. And it's very interesting toward the end, he says, you know, isn't there grain? You know, you have grain, you, you have seeds, uh, it's all there. And I will bless you as you walk well with the Lord, and I will indeed bless you. Blessing comes in varieties of ways. But uh, may we take uh, this word to heart, and may we, uh, in our own selves, in our own lives, let us set our heart on our ways. Let's think about the way we live. And may we maybe recalibrate a little bit, repent, get our eyes clear, focused on what's, what's the most important thing. And uh, may uh, God bless us as we walk with him. Let's pray. Lord, uh, God, uh, I pray, Lord, that uh, we would not uh, react randomly to random events. 
I pray, Lord, that we would give thought to the way that we respond, react in a godly way, Lord, so that we can fulfill the calling that you've given us in this world, that we would not be distracted by all the things around us, but that we would stay focused indeed on you, Lord. And I pray, uh, God, whether we're talking about uh, you know, uh, our life congregationally, uh, the, the, the entire uh, body of Messiah worldwide, or in our own homes, in our own lives. Lord, we all face challenges. We all have challenges, challenges at home or at work or with family or, or with the, the work you've given us to do here. There's always impediments. There's always challenges. Lord, I pray that we would keep our priorities right. We would stay focused. We would keep moving forward and uh, recognize, Lord, that you ultimately do indeed bring the victory. And we thank you that the victory has indeed come in Messiah Yeshua, but the ultimate victory, uh, indeed, we look forward to. We thank you in Messiah's name.